Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the Young Physicians Forum and College Lecture. We are going to start the Young Physicians Forum and College Lecture afterwards, and the lunch will be distributed afterwards. And uh, for the Young Physicians Forum, next speaker is Dr. Harvey Sundra. ंगस She obtained the Indian medicine from the University of Kerala in 2023. The topic that she has chosen for today is myocardial infarction in the young. No longer living in this. For you, Dr. Abdullah. Thank you very much, sir, for those kind words of introduction, and thank you, CCP, for giving me this opportunity to deliver my talk on myocardial infarction in the young, no longer a needle in haystack. So I think uh, myocardial infarction is uh, was in this particular group was not that prevalent at 15 years ago, but uh, it is no longer the case now. Uh, so, so, so this would be the outline of my study uh, talk. and uh, coming to the definition so acute myocardial infarction in the young so this category of young in terms to myocardial infarction so what the age group that most of the research and uh, the guidelines recommend is if for less than 14 years however certain studies also has expanded that up to the age limit of 45 years as well Uh, so why it's very important to talk about myocardial infarction and acute coronary syndromes in the young? Uh, so one thing is it's not well studied. Although coronary artery disease and ischemic heart disease is something that is very widely and extensively studied, so this particular group is not very 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 much studied even in the developed world. And they have a very unique risk profile and they have syndromes unique to this age group. And also there will be a diversity of presentation sometimes age. typical and delayed presentations and despite the advances of uh, cardiovascular medicine uh, although the mortality and the incidence of these disorders are coming uh, the trend is in reducing uh, directions in the older people it's not as same in the young and uh, there will be problems in the management with regards to poor adherence to treatment and high chances of default especially with regards to substance abuses and uh, after all young Uh, is the workforce of the country and they are breadwinners of the families so if they are affected and crippled with the myocardial infarction so that will have a greater impact to the economy of the country so when coming to prevalence as i previously said the data is quite limited even in the developed countries so in this framingham heart study uh, that is a 10 year follow up data so which has showed uh, these are the rough, uh, the prevalences of the myocardial infarction in females and males and you can see even in young it's more predominant in the male population uh, and a similar study that was done in us has also shown that over the years uh, myocardial infarction in the young has increased so these are some features that we see uh, some differentiating factors between the young versus old so the things which are more prevalent on young comparative to older so they are having more modifiable risk factors for coronary artery disease and in uh, coronary angiograms as well as in post mortem studies when the patients present with sudden cardiac death they have found mostly these patients are having single vessel cardio uh, coronary artery disease that is also mostly left anterior descending and uh, they are having more uh, non nephrometic uh, acute myocardial infarction compared to the olds and also they have a significant family history of premature coronary artery disease uh, so this is similar data again coming from a large uh, study that was done in china so the clinical presentation so most patients present with chest pain could be atypical or typical and non st elevated mi is more prevalent than st elevated mi so history of angina before mi is less common so you know in old people they may be having chronic coronary syndrome in the background with stable angina like symptoms but these people are not quite uh, having that sort of a history prior to the onset of mi and also uh, se several studies have found that there had been a longer delay in 
they are getting medical attention. So this may be that they are underestimating their personal cardiovascular risk factors just because they are young. And moving on to the etiology and the pathogenesis. So etiology of myocardial infarction in young people are again broadly divided. It could be atheromatous, MI, and non-atheromatous. So again, vast majority of these uh, myocardial infarctions are caused by atheromatous MI, like in the old people. So which could be due to traditional risk factors and also non-traditional risk factors. And the rest minority is accountable from the non-atheromatous MI. So uh, atherosclerosis in my again, so we know atherosclerosis is a process that starts at a very young age from fatty streaks and it will progress with accumulating risk factors. But in these people, they are usually having premature atherosclerosis, which is sort of having accelerated atherosclerosis. So the pathogenesis is the same as in young. So accelerated atherosclerosis, so there will be increased systemic inflammation, increased sympathetic activity, oxidative stress, endothelial dysfunction. These all factors can lead to early atherosclerosis. So coming on to traditional risk factors, these are the risk factors that you all know, which can affect MI, whether they are old or young. However, most of the studies have found uh, out of these risk factors, smoking and hyperlipidemia are very much prevalent in young. So smoking is, in fact, the commonest one, and that is a modifiable risk factor. And uh, talking about hyperlipidemia, especially familial heterozygous hyperlipidemia, which can cause very high elevations of LDL cholesterol. And we, if we do not pick them up, they definitely will be ending up with uh, premature myocardial infarction. So apart from the traditional risk factors, they also have non-traditional risk factors that can accelerate atherosclerosis. Most of these conditions are more commonly prevalent in young. So there can be autoimmune disorders like SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, not only the disorder, but also most of the immune suppressive medications can secondarily increase the cardiovascular risk. And the inflammatory disorders like psoriasis, certain genetic disorders, and again, infections like retroviral, which is very commonly prevalent nowadays, and also other metabolic disorders. So all these non-traditional risk factors also account for the accelerated atherosclerosis. And talking about non-nethromatous MI, so in the talk, I will be more uh, elaborating about these non-nethromatous MI because we are not very much familiar with those. But always remember that only accounts for a minority. Still, the vast majority of these MIs are caused by the traditional risk factors and athero. So under non-nethromatous MI, I would be talking about the coronary epicardial vasospasm as well as microvascular dysfunctions spontaneous coronary artery dissection, coronary embolic phenomena and hypercoagulability, and autoimmune-mediated coronary vasculitis. So the spasms, it's a rare, and, but it is important cause in young, especially uh, with related to the drug abuse. And it's a transient process where uh, the coronaries will undergo the spasm, and if it is persistent and quite refractory, can end up with myocardial necrosis. So it could be de novo, like what we see in variant angina, prince middle angina, where the uh, coronary, uh, the smooth muscles are quite hyperactive and hypercontractile, but also it can happen in the presence of exogenous stimuli, uh, where like sympathomimetic psychoactive drugs like cocaine, methamphetamine, these drugs also can cause vasospasms. So the clue is usually these patients get the chest pain not with, uh, without any exertion, they are maybe having repetitive episodes. And when we do the coronary angiogram, usually they are having non-obstructive uh, coronary arteries that is less than 50% stenosis in the arteries. So it is paramount that we take a detailed history of recreational drugs and have a high degree of suspicion, especially when very young patients are coming with myocardial infarction. So the di definitive diagnosis is from the provocative testing, which is not readily available in, available in our country. And uh, the management, overall single most important management is uh, to stop smoking because Prince Michelangelo is mostly associated with smokers and females. And also we have to uh, find the culprit if there are these, like if the patient is on an illicit or precipitant drugs, we have to stop them. Medical treatment wise, we can use long acting nitrates and non dihydropyridine as well as dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. Uh, so a word about the recreational drug use. So out of the drugs, cocaine, amphetamine, and methamphetamine are most culprits. Cannabis also can cause. So because this entity is very prevalent in young comparative to the older people. So they can cause myocardial infarction in different mechanisms. So 
type 1 MI also can be caused if they are having background atherosclerosis. These drugs are notorious to increase the blood pressure and shear forces and causes acute plaque change and thrombosis. And also in addition, as I said, they can cause vasospasms and they can cause tachyarrhythmias uh, and uh, problems with the demand and supply. And sudden cardiac death is a uh, recognized association. So management wise, again, so if you suspect uh, drug abuse and related vasospasm, it's best not to give beta, uh, select your beta 1 adrenergic receptor blockade because otherwise it will cause an underposed alpha action and worsen the coronary spasms and exacerbate the symptoms. So again, the main target medical treatment is from the calcium channel blockers. However, so if it is secondary to drug abuse, rehabilitation and the support for the abstinence should be given. Otherwise, this would be recurring. And at the ED, if you are having a high degree of suspicion, because the very first time when we encounter patients, drug abusers never tell that they abuse drugs. So if you have a high degree of suspicion, send the urine toxicology sample as well. And a word about spontaneous coronary artery dissection. This is not a very common entity, but it is important, especially uh, in considering pregnancy and uh, postpartum. And also, uh, it could be seen in certain connective tissue disorders like uh, fibromuscular dysplasia, as well as Dan Danlos and Marfan syndrome. So spontaneous scat means it's a non-traumatic and a non nitrogenic separation of the layers of the coronary arterial wall in the absence of atherosclerosis. So these are the risk factors and diagnosis is usually from angio. So where you can see multiple radiolucent lines and contrast staining. Sometimes angios may be not uh, diagnostic. In that case, there are certain advanced imaging modalities that we can do with intravascular uh, ultrasounds and the uh, optic coherence tomography. So these are some of the angiographic pictures. Uh, and there are types uh, which are a bit advanced depending on the coronary angiogram. Uh, views. And the management, again, since this is an uncommon variety, the evidence-based management is limited. But general rule is usually these spontaneous dissections do heal spontaneously after a couple of months. So because of that, majority of patients would be ending up with conservative management. If the patient is having, uh, like if the patients are hemodynamically unstable, having ongoing ischemia and ventricular arrhythmias, then uh, there is a place for revascularization, either uh, PCI or CE ABG, depending on certain characteristics and the expertise available. Um, then moving on to the thromboembolic MI. Uh, so hypercoagulable states can cause thrombosis even in the absence of atherosclerosis. So the well-recognized syndromes are antiphospholipid syndrome, Bechet's homocysteinuria and myeloproliferative disorders. And uh, these are again common in the young. Uh, and talking about coronary embolism, so uh, emboli can, the source of the emboli can come from different uh, areas, uh, the valvular material, neoplasms, uh, neoplas infectious material in vegetation. So those things can come and obstruct the coronary arteries. So there are three main mechanisms. It could be direct, paradoxical, or iatrogenic. Uh, so direct is where it is uh, in the uh, heart or the major vessels, and then you get the embolization. Paradoxical is, as we know, if you are having a PF or ASD, you can get a venous embolism. And iatrogenic is when uh, that is happening during the procedures. So again, the diagnosis uh, we can do from the coronary angiogram, especially if there is obstructive lesion without any evidence of background atherosclerosis, then you may have to suspect whether this is coronary embolism. And management depends on that we have to find the source and get the source control and also to see if it is a part of systemic embolization to see whether there are other organ territories are also involved. So the therapeutic options, there is aspiration thrombectomy and also uh, intracoronary thrombolytics and anticoagulants can be used. A uh, word about coronary vasculitis. So, although it's uncommon, again, in the young population like pediatric in Kawasaki disease and in young people like Takayasu arteritis, polyarteritis nodosa, and certain variable uh, vessel vasculitis like SLE and Bechet's can cause coronary vasculitis. Uh, so, the management is mainly targeting the autoimmune process with immunosuppression. Uh, finally, a word, about, a word about myocarditis. Patients can come with chest pain, especially symptoms of heart failure, cardiogenic shock, and having ST elevations in the ECGs. So you have to suspect, especially if there is a background of viral prodrome and all of that, whether this could be myocarditis or perimyocarditis. 
uh, <clears throat> and uh, since we are talking about young people, I think pregnancy, we can't forget about pregnancy. So because pregnancy and acute myocardial infarction, it's an important cause of maternal morbidity, mortality, as well as fetal outcomes. And the mortality rate is twice high. And it is found the risk is more during the third trimester and during the postpartum. And it is increased in multi gravidas. So they can have type 1 MI, but it is a bit rare that it is atheromatous MI. It is usually the type 2 MI that we see. And out of that also, spontaneous coronary artery dissections are more prevalent. Uh, and also, sometimes when we give certain medications like uh, got derivatives of like postpartum hemorrhage, or uh, due to they are having in the third trimester, they are having uteruses, especially in the superimposition reduction of the blood pressure. Because of that, there is increased vascular reactivity to angiotensin and noradrenaline. So these things can also cause vasospasm related uh, ischemia or infarction. So the management in pregnancy is highly specialized and it needs a multidisciplinary approach. So the optimum care of what is recommended in the guidelines is a, if it is a, a, a my uh, STEMI, it's a primary a PCI and uh, probably to postpone the delivery two to three weeks after the MI and also uh, uh, to give the measures to reduce the cardiac workload as much as possible. Uh, aspirin and beta blockers are safer in pregnancy, but we know the other drugs, some are contraindicated and some are unsafe or not studied. Uh, so it is said that ionizing radiation is the problem, but since most of these are occurring in the later pregnancy, so the teratogenic effects are less, and considering the benefit to the mother, using the minimum amount of radiation, these can be preceded. And as the anticoagulation, uh, they, uh, they recommend uh, heparin, but we have to remember the complications are more. Uh, so coming on to the prevention uh, of whole young MI. So prevention of risk factors. I think uh, we all know prevention is better than cure. And this is a non-communicable disease. So once you get it, we can't completely cure them unless there is a certain specific unique syndromes. So because of that, it's primary prevention is uh, very important because as I stressed earlier, it is more than 90% it's atheromatous MI and it's traditional cardiovascular risk factors. And if it is a unique syndrome, then we have to give the etiology targeted management versus conventional treatment. And shared decision making between clinicians and patients can improve the adherence. And cardiac rehabilitation is very important as a part of secondary prevention. So challenges, as I previously said, the delayed presentations, and we need the correct diagnosis of unique syndromes. And we have to ensure that the patients are adherent to treatment, especially this is a problem in, with regards to substance use. And uh, as we all know, the condition in our country and in national hospital, I think it's very hard to find, like a needle in the haystack to find a person who has undergone a primary PCI due to the unavailability of the resources. So because of that, we don't have resources due to the economic constraints. So it is always important to prevent these things uh, rather than before occurring. So I think not only the prime, prime uh, primary prevention, even primordial prevention at the level of the very young stage, uh, to assess the traditional uh, cardiovascular risk factors that is paramount. Uh, so these are the take-home messages. Incidence of AMI in young patients are rising, and the presentations can be quite diverse and atypical. Uh, there are several pathological causes, atheromatous versus non-atheromatous. So early recognition of the non-atherosclerotic causes for etiology-directed therapies, but always remember majority is due to atherosclerosis, and we need more aggressive preventive strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bungarna. It's time for the study and doctors. What is the state of Sri Lanka? Do we get there now? Are there studies done in Sri Lanka regarding this young myocardial infarctions? Uh, so I'm not aware whether there are ongoing studies, but I could not come out with uh, any significant literature on that, sir. Okay, if a patient has very high cholesterol, say LDL, not responding to your settings and uh, the other things of diet, exercise, okay. is there anything that you can do? 
Uh, yes, sir, that would be the case mainly in familial hypercholesterolemia. So it's very difficult to control them with diet and exercise. So statins are the major thing. But then uh, if they are not achieving the targets, we can go to other medications like acetimab that is available in our country. And then the, there are these PC SK9 inhibitors like drugs, which are, of course, I don't think that is available in Sri Lanka. So, uh, and it, when extremely high levels of LDL, like in familial forms, there is a place for LDL, LDL aparesis as well, that is removal from LDL. In terms of prevention, good nature, and thank you for the In terms of prevention, uh, what are the most important things that you should do? Uh, like you know, keeping in mind the cost as well. Uh, so in the prime, the I think it should start from the very beginning, sir. Like uh, at what age? Uh, I think from the childhood, sir. So even like from the general, like even from the advertisement, so that is the small age where the patients get inculcate things into their mind. So the healthy living, healthy lifestyle, the foods, uh, and avoiding the bad habits like smoking. So all these things should be even, I think, brought up to the level of the primary education and on. So it is not, I think it should start and begin. Uh, assessment regarding the risk factors. Um, the risk of vital infarction. Risk of. So I think uh, one thing is they are metabolic to assess the metabolic risk factors. The other thing is the family history, uh, which is very, uh, which is a very predominant feature. And uh, again, uh, about any substance use, the psychosocial stressors. Uh, yeah, and that the, the issue with the young people is that, that the most important thing to assess uh, the risk is using the respiration chart. Yeah. Uh, but all the respiration chart starts after 35 or 40. So there's no respiration chart for young people. Mm -hmm. What we follow in Sri Lanka is the WHO, yes, the respiration chart that is specifically for. Sri Lanka and few other countries. So, for a young person, the most important question to ask is the families. The families of premature pregnancies, they offer at least. And uh, checking their political levels after 20 years. That is how you find the family of the policy and you should treat it. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Dunna, for that excellent presentation and CCP. Uh, so, it's the appreciation of the media scientific